When I think of his name, Uzziah, I am reminded of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. That's probably the greatest statement made about this man. Is that his death caused Isaiah to open his eyes. When you read the book of Isaiah, for the first five chapters, Isaiah is a sermonizer. He's going around, he's saying, you're going to hell, and you're going to hell, and you're going to hell, and everybody's going to get killed off. And <laughs> he's quite forceful in his argument. And he's very judgmental. But in chapter 6, when Uzziah the king dies, because I think Isaiah had his eyes on the king. And finally, when the king is dead, Uzziah sees the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. This is a revolutionary change in a man's life when you see this. And it takes place because of this man's death. So, because he is such a catalyst for someone else, I want to take a look at his life. We're given his life, really, in the book of 2 Chronicles. And in 2 Chronicles, uh, chapter 26, you come to his story. There are some 25 verses that we are given about his life. Yep, nope, 23 verses. That looked like a five, but it was a three. 23 verses were given about this man's life. So let us consider this man who was really such a spark plug uh, for Isaiah. Isaiah probably the greatest of the writing prophets. And uh, he lived in a hard and difficult time and uh, he was trying to bring these nations, particularly he preached both to Israel and to Judah, although primarily he was preaching here to Judah. Both sides, Judah and Israel, had a problem with forsaking God. Kind of like the generation in which we live. America, by and large, has forsaken God, and those of us who are still standing in the highways and byways and compelling to them to come in are growing smaller and smaller by the number. Even though churches are growing larger and larger, their message is changing, and the gospel is being lost. This is King Uzziah. This is the verses that I think really laid down his life for us. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, I've chosen verses 15 and 16 because it shows both his brilliance and his problem. Notice, he made in Jerusalem engines. He didn't make motors. You have to understand that an engine of war is not a motor. An engine of war is what you and I might consider a catapult. I'm sure you've seen those machines where the Roman army and they would take and they would pull a rope real tight and then they'd let it go and it would swing around and throw that rock through the air. And that rock would fly however far and fall upon the enemy. Those were engines. So he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks, the towers on the corner and in the large walkway, the, the, the uh, wall themselves. And they could shoot arrows and great stones great distances. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Now I want you to notice this. He was marvelously helped. Who helped him? God did. He was a successful man in a lot of endeavors. He was a successful man in uh, building up the city of Jerusalem. He was a great builder. He built large, fortified large sections of the walls. He built many cities. In fact, he was not only a great builder, but he was a great warrior. For example, he went to battle against the Philistines. 
And he took out one of the famous cities, the Goliath of Gath. You remember Goliath of Gath, the giant? He conquered the city of Gath and he built a fort in Gath. And he built many of these fortified cities throughout the Palestinian area, or I should say Philistine area, same area pretty much today. And he built these areas wherever it was near the frontier, he would build these fortified cities. And so he became very famous as a great warrior. He knew how to fight. He had a great army. He had basically one guy that was real close to him. And he had an army, his personal army of about 2,600. They trained the larger army of, I think it was like 700,000. But he learned how to delegate. He would train this man and say, now you train someone else. He trained this man, now you go train someone else. And so he could duplicate himself through the process of delegation. Nobody can do everything. So we have to learn to teach people to do those other things so I can do more things if I teach. At work, I train this man to do this thing and this man to do this thing and this man to do this thing. And so as a whole, the business runs well. Engineering department, we're second to none. Everybody will brag on our engineering departments because all of our engineers know what to do because I've made sure that I train them to do it. And so you can't do it all. No one person can run an entire hospital. And so what we do is we train and delegate and that's what made him so popular. His warriors, his architects, his builders, he loved husbandry. This man loved to plant vineyards. But of course, as a king, how busy are you? So he trained men how to love husbandry as much as he did. So they would go up to, he loved the countryside up there at Mount Carmel. And so he trained the people to plant these beautiful, beautiful vineyards around Mount Carmel. So here he was building over here, warring uh, oh, over there, and planting up over here while in this one place because he had learned to delegate so he could pass it on out. I, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Let me finish. Now, I, here's where things get wrong. Whenever you see a but, you know something's going to happen. God doesn't drop those butts in there without a purpose. Because listen, everything is sounding good. He made engines in Jerusalem Invented by cunning men, see? He knew how to get those men. He knew how to train them. He knew how to give them his idea. And these men helped him to build. He was able to protect the city by his ability to cast these stones way out there at the enemy before they could get close enough. And he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Who helped him? God helped give him all these ideas. Now, here's the one downfall. When you read... Chronicles, Second Chronicles particularly, and when you read the book of the Kings and you read about Uzziah, there's one thing you never hear him say. You never hear him say, thank you, Lord. You never hear him be grateful for what God has done. He never acknowledges that God did it. Even though he was marvelously helped, he doesn't see it that way. He sees that I marvelously thought it all up. I marvelously beat their army with mine. I marvelously built those vineyards out there. I marvelously came up with this idea. I am a marvelous guy. He isn't marveled by what God's doing in his presence. He doesn't see God. He only sees himself. See, when you step in front of God, you can't see him. Even though God is doing all the work, you don't see it because you're in front of God. It's so important that we stay behind the Lord. That's where followers belong, behind the leader. And then by being behind him, we could watch him work. He never says thank you. And this is going to be his downfall. Part of his problem well, we'll get to that. I got a list of things we have to go through, right? So let's read. But when he, look at this. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his 
destruction. How many of you know what his destruction was? Do you remember what King Uzziah died of? Leprosy. Yeah, leprosy is a picture of sin. The king, well, here, God will tell you why he did it. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. And he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now listen, it doesn't sound all that big a deal. Incense is a picture of prayer. The king takes incense, goes into the temple, walks over to the temple or the altar where prayers are made, and he simply wants to place some incense on the prayer altar. Doesn't sound like the end of the world. But God kills him for it. It doesn't, I mean, it's, he didn't murder anybody, did he? No. But here's the problem. He was a king, not a priest. It is for the priest to burn incense on the altar. In the life of Jesus, we're told about his great uncle, or I think it's Mary's cousin, actually. He went into the temple, Zechariah, John's dad, went into the temple and he burned incense on the altar and nothing happened to him. Uzziah, the king, goes to the same altar and burns incense on that altar and God strikes him with leprosy. Both did the exact same act. But for one man, the king, it was forbidden. For the other man, a priest, it was required. So here we have this great king who accomplished great things in warfare. He accomplished great things in construction. He accomplished great things in husbandry. He accomplished great things. And maybe, see, here's what he did. You're not a priest. Well, I can do a lot of stuff. Didn't I build those engines up there? Didn't I develop, didn't I cultivate Mount Carmel? Didn't I build that city and that city and that city? And didn't I defeat all of our enemies? So that now our enemies are paying taxes to us? Didn't I do all that? So he goes into the temple. And of course, as soon as the king comes in and he's carrying with him incense, the priests, about five or six of them, whose job it was to burn the incense, go to get the incense and he brushes them away in order to pour it on the altar himself. And they say, stop! These prince, or, or priests actually block the king from doing what he wanted to do. Risky, because he could take their lives. And they say, you can't do that. You're not a priest. You're only the king. Only the king? Only the king. You don't get to do this. He brushed them aside, and just as he was about to pour out the incense, all of a sudden, he felt something on his forehead. He could feel his forehead changing. And the men who were standing there arguing with him, suddenly the priests begin to back up. And he says, I feel something. What are you looking at? Leprosy. I'm sorry, king, but you're a leper. You can't be in the temple anymore. You know the rule. He couldn't even go back to his own palace. They made him a small house where he would live the rest of his life and die. A leper. Cut off. He died. This great man, this wonderful builder, this tremendous warrior, this gifted farmer, died alone and a leper in 23 verses. Jesus, and here's part of the problem. Jesus is the prophet and priest and king. You don't get to be Jesus. He wanted to be the prophet, the priest, and the king. There's only one of them. You don't get, to, and that's really the picture that he was breaking 
was the picture of the coming Savior. Remember Moses, what was Moses' great crime that God didn't let him go into the land? He simply hit a rock twice. The first time God said, hit the rock. The second time God said, speak to the rock. Both times water would come out. But Moses was upset. Of course he's old, he's like 120 years old. And he's a little upset with the people. So when God said, speak to the rock, wait, last time I hit it and it worked really good. So he hits it again. God said, you don't get to go in the promised land because you don't hang Jesus twice on the cross. You can only hang him there once. And Moses hitting the rock was a picture of Jesus being crucified twice. This man pouring incense on the altar, done legally by the priest, was him saying, I'm the prophet, the priest, and the king. That's why I never bothered to thank you, because I am me. Didn't work so well. Let's take a look at his life then. First of all, let's look at the good. Now, when he was young, we read that first verse, verse 15, when he was strong. So while he was young, he walked pleasing to God in his youth. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because again, he became king when he's 18 years old. He is going to remain king for 52 years. Yeah. So he's going to be 70 when he dies. Or actually stops reigning. He's going to die, live another year, I think, or so, and then die. But he's about 70 when he quits being king. And his son's going to take over because he can't be the king anymore. He's got leprosy. So his son takes over in the final stages of his life. But for 52 years, he's going to be king. And he does pretty good for most of it. When he was young. And in the Bible, he's young at like in his 50s. Even in his 60s, he's still considered pretty much young. You don't really get old, apparently. So you get that side of 70 or so, according to this. He walked pleasing to God in his youth. And his youth here is like 50, 60 years old. So hey, I'm still almost kind of youthful at this stage. I can hang out with my grandsons. Me and my granddaughter can go and talk about boys because I'm still kind of youthful, see? We walk pleasing to God in his youth. He was a great warrior, as we said. He was a great builder, he was a skillful organizer, and he was able to delegate, and all of those things helped to make him a great success. They did not make him grateful. They only made him great. And it would be better if he had learned to be grateful than to be called great. Great king, great king, great king. You know, you hear that so many times, pretty soon you start to believe it. Look what you did. Wow, they must be holding parades for this guy up and down the street almost every other day. And you know, you have that many parades in your arm and you might, be, uh, you might begin to believe that you did some of those things. We know that God's working behind the scenes because as we read the pages, God kind of hints, here am I. But with all this greatness, he dies a leper. But he did inspire. See, this is how come you, um, Isaiah couldn't see God. Because he could see this marvelous king. And he could see all the wonderful things that he did. You could walk around Jerusalem after 52 years and see all the monuments that this man had built or others had built to him. You could see the cities and you knew the enemies round about. You were at peace and they were sending money so your city was becoming rich because your enemies were paying for it. So he was quite a marvelous man. No wonder Isaiah's eyes were attracted to him. And he was a great preacher. And, and boy, let me tell you, he had preached sin against everybody. But we don't find that God commissions Isaiah until you get to chapter 6. When King Uzziah died. Then Isaiah says, then I saw the Lord. He was a preacher beforehand. He was a firebrand of a preacher beforehand. 
But preaching aloud and preaching death and destruction doesn't necessarily mean that God's on your side. We got a lot of those today. All right, let's talk about the bad. He became proud because of success. People often say your greatest danger of falling is at the moment of your highest success. You get so high on, where else you got to go but down. When you're on the bottom, you're grounded. But as you begin to climb that ladder of success, you begin to say to yourself, look what I have done, look what I have done, look what I have done. He became proud because of all the successes all around in every venture. When he went out, he was successful. Whatever he did was blessed of God and he was, but he didn't see that God was blessing him. He didn't say, wow, did you see what the Lord did with us? Did you see how the Lord helped us with this and how the Lord helped us with that? So he became proud. And so like Saul, he tried to perform the priestly duties. Saul did the same thing. He wanted to go to war. So he called all the people together and said, listen, before we can go to war, we have to kill a gold, we have to slay a calf. We have to kill a bull on the altar to show God that we're, well, that was again the job of the priests. And Samuel hadn't showed up yet. So King Saul got up there and he, kills the animal. He begins the process that belonged to the priests. And remember how God took the kingdom from Saul. I have taken the kingdom from you because you have performed the duty of a priest. Now you figure Uzziah would have remembered that. But it's been quite a few years since that happened. And sure enough, because he was filled with pride, just like Saul was, everybody's telling him how wonderful he was, then if I'm that great, maybe I can burn the incense this time. His last thing, of course, he got so busy doing a lot of stuff, he kind of forgot to take care of that idolatry part, which God hates idolatry. And Uzziah was busy building, he was busy conquering, he was busy being a farmer, oh, we'll take care of those some other time. And he never got around to dealing with the problem of idolatry and God held that against him. And part of his idolatry was thinking he was a priest or could. Maybe God doesn't really, maybe God's word is only God's word. And maybe it doesn't really matter. Maybe what he wrote isn't as important as what we're doing today. And that's kind of what people are thinking here and even at Christians think in America. It's not so important what is written here it's important what we're doing over here. And we're about to get in as much trouble as he did. If God touched the Church of America like he touched this man, we'd all have leprosy, I think. Or at least a good fair share of us. So what do we learn from this man? Two things I think we could learn. Number one, success can lead to pride. We have to always be careful. When we have a success, we pass a test in school, you get an A, did you bother to thank the Lord for helping you to remember? JD is a holy man and he gets, takes a lot of tests. He's always being tested and so he gets a good grade on his math. Did he say thank you Jesus for helping me with my math? He takes his history test, he says thank you Jesus for helping me remember those trick questions that that teacher was giving me, trying to follow me up, but you were there with me and I did good. My Jenna Mayer, same thing. Oh, Lord, thank you for that great grade I got over here in this class and this class. And of course, my handsome grandson, thank you, Jesus, for teaching me how to drive and not run over my grandpa. You know, we have to make sure that in our successes, we say thank you so that we don't become full of pride. That's the danger. Success leads to pride if we're not grateful. When you become great, remember, you have a tendency not to be grateful. So we want to make sure that with our greatness we're also grateful. When God has done something and we see it, we want to know that it's not us who did it. Going back to last Christmas at that wonderful offering that was given, that wasn't us. We want to make sure that the Lord got the credit 
for what was done. It's important that we do those things so we keep ourselves small in his sight. And secondly, it's a link to it, to avoid pride, acknowledge God's grace in your success. Don't be afraid to say, thank you, Lord. When you move up the ladder of success, God helped you. If you fell down, you did that one probably pretty much on yourself. However, God could have pushed you back down because you forgot to say thankful the last time. And so we have to remember that success can lead to pride if we avoid to acknowledge that God is the source of our success. So we want to not be like King Uzziah. We don't want to be the one who doesn't acknowledge God. However, in all of his faults, this man was the catalyst for one of the greatest of prophets. You, by your living, either as a good example to our children or as a bad example to our neighbors, we might lead ourselves into being a great example to someone. In the year that King Uzziah died, I finally, finally saw the Lord. And I didn't just see him, but I saw him high and lifted up. This man didn't see God high and lifted up. He saw God almost as an equal. And the year that this man died, I saw God. And I saw him high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Wow. I wouldn't give anything for that vision. To see what he saw the way he saw it. But for six years, he was blinded because he had this man to look at. What a wonderful king until the end. In his youth, followed God until the day he didn't. Let's pray.